At the conference that December, we in the Youth League knew we had the votes to depose Dr. Zuma. As an alternative candidate, we sponsored Dr. J.S. Moroka for the presidency. He was not our first choice. Professor Z.K. Matthews was the man we wanted to lead us. But Z.K. considered us too radical and our plan of action too impractical. He called us naive firebrands, adding that we would mellow with age. Dr. Moroka was an unlikely choice. He was a member of the All-African Convention, which was dominated by Trotskyite's elements at that time. When he agreed to stand against Dr. Zuma, the Youth League then enrolled him as a member of the ANC. When first approached, he consistently deferred to the ANC as the African National Council. He was not very knowledgeable about the ANC. Neither was he an experienced activist but he was respectable and amenable to our program. Like Dr. Zuma, he was a doctor and one of the wealthiest black men in South Africa. He had studied at Edinburgh and Vienna. His great-grandfather had been a chief in the Orange Free State and it greeted the Afrikaner woodtrackers of the 19th century with open arms and gifts of land and then been betrayed. Dr. Zuma was defeated and Dr. Moroka became President General of the ANC. Walter Sisulu was elected the new Secretary General and Oliver Tembo was elected to the National Executive. The program of action approved at the annual conference called for the pursuit of political rights through the use of boycotts, strikes, civil disobedience and non-cooperation. In addition, it called for a national day of work stoppage in protest against the racist and reactionary policies of the government. This was a departure from the days of decorous protest, and many of the old stalwarts of the ANC were to fade away in this new era of greater militancy. Youth League members had now graduated to the senior organization. We had now guided the ANC to a more radical and revolutionary path. I could only celebrate the Youth League's triumph from a distance, for I was unable to attend the conference. I was then working for a new law firm and then did not give me permission to take two days off to attend the conference in Bloemfontein. The firm was a liberal one, but wanted me to concentrate on my work and forget politics. I would have lost my job if I had attended the conference and I could not afford to do that. The spirit of mass action surged, but I remained skeptical of any action undertaken with the communists and Indians. The Defend Free Speech Convention in March 1950 Organized by the Transvaal ANC, the Transvaal Indian Congress, the African People's Organization and the District Committee of the Communist Party drew 10,000 people to Johannesburg's Market Square. Dr. Moroka, without consulting the executive, agreed to preside over the convention. The convention was a success, yet I remained wary as the prime mover behind it was the party. At the instigation of the Communist Party, and the Indian Congress, the convention passed a resolution for a one-day general strike known as Freedom Day on 1st May, calling for the abolition of the past laws and all discriminatory legislations. Although I supported these objectives, I believe that the communists were trying to steal the thunder from the ANC's National Day of Protest. I opposed the May Day strike on the grounds that the ANC had not originated the campaign, believing that we should concentrate on our own campaign. Ahmed Katrada was then barely 21 and, like all youths, eager to flex his muscles. He was a key member of the Transwell Indian Youth Congress and had heard I was opposed to the May Day strike. One day while walking along Commissioner Street, I met Katrada and he heatedly confronted me, charging that I and the Youth League did not want to work with Indians or Colorettes. In a challenging tone, he said, You are an African leader and I am an Indian youth. But I am convinced of the supporter, support of the African masses for the strike and I challenge you to nominate any African township for a meeting and I guarantee the people will support me. It was a hollow threat but it angered me all the same. I even complained to a joint meeting of the executive committees of the ANC, the South African Indian Congress and the Communist Party but Smile Meal calmed me down saying, Nelson he is young and hot headed, don't you be the same. I consequently felt a bit sheepish about my actions and I withdrew the complaint. Although I disagreed with Katrada, I admired his fire and it was an incident we came to laugh about. The Freedom Day strike went ahead without official ANC support. In anticipation, 
the government banned all meetings and gatherings on 1st May. More than two thirds of African workers stayed at home during the one day strike. That night, Walter and I were in Orlando West on the fringes of a Freedom Day crowd that had gathered despite the government's restrictions. The moon was bright and we watched the orderly march of protesters. We could see a group of policemen camped across a stream about 500 yards away. They must have seen us as well, because all of a sudden they started firing in our direction. We dived to the ground and remained there as mounted police galloped into the crowd, smashing people with batons. We took refuge in a nearby nurse's dormitory where we heard bullets smashing into the wall of the building. 18 Africans died and many others were wounded in this indiscriminate and unprovoked attack. Despite protest and criticism, the nationalist response was to tighten the screws of repression. A few weeks later, the government introduced the notorious Suppression of Communism Act, and the ANC called an emergency conference in Johannesburg. The act outlawed, outlawed the Communist Party of South Africa and made it a crime, punishable by a maximum of 10 years imprisonment, to be a member of the party or to further the aims of communism. But the bill was drafted in such a broad way that it outlawed all but the mildest protest against the state deeming it a crime to advocate any doctrine that promoted political, industrial, social or economic change within the union by the promotion of disturbance or disorder. Essentially, the bill permitted the government to outlaw any organization and to restrict any individual opposed to its policies. The ANC, the SAIC and the APO again met to discuss these new measures and Dr. Dadu, among others, said that it would be foolish to allow past differences to thwart a united front against the government. I spoke and echoed the, his sentiments. Clearly, the repression of any one liberation group was repression of all liberation groups. It was at that meeting that Oliver uttered prophetic words, Today it is the Communist Party, tomorrow it will be our trade union, our Indian Congress, our APO, our African National Congress. Supported by the SAIC and the APO, the ANC resolved to stage a national day of protest on 26 June 1950 against the government's murder of 18 Africans on 1st May and the passage of the Suppression of Communism Act. The proposal was ratified and in preparation for the day of protest, we closed ranks with the SAIC, the APO and the Communist Party. Here I believed was a sufficient threat that compelled us to join hands with our Indian and Communist colleagues. Earlier that year, I had been co-opted onto the National Executive Committee of the ANC, taking the place of Dr. Zuma, who had resigned after his failure to be re-elected President General. I was not unmindful of the fact that it had been Dr. Zuma who had tried to help me get my first job when I came to Johannesburg 10 years before, when I had no thought of entering politics. Now, as a member of the National Executive, I was playing into the first team with the most senior people in the ANC. I had moved from the role of a gaffly within the organization to one of the powers that I had been rebelling against. It was a heady feeling and not without mixed emotions. In some ways, it is easier to be a dissident for then one is without responsibility. As a member of the executive, I had to weigh arguments and make decisions and expect to be criticized by rebels like myself. Mass action was perilous in South Africa, where it was a criminal offense for an African to strike and where the rights of free speech and movement were unmercifully curtailed. By striking, an African worker stood to lose not only his job, but his entire livelihood and his right to stay in the area in which he was living. In my experience, a political strike is always riskier than an economical one. A strike based on a political grievance rather than in clear-cut issues such as higher wages or shorter hours is a more precarious form of protest and demands particularly efficient organization. The day of protest was a political rather than an economic strike. In preparation for 26 June, Walter travelled around the country consulting local leaders. In his absence, I took charge of the bustling ANC office, the hub of a complicated national action. Every day, various leaders looked in to see that matters were going according to plan. President of the Transvaal ANC, Yusuf Kalhalia, and his brother Molvi 
Gore Radebe, Secretary of the Council of Action, Michael Hernell, Peter Rebrocco, and Nitoho Motlana. I was coordinating the actions in different parts of the country and talking by phone with regional leaders. We had left ourselves little time and the planning was hastily done.